Welcome back, everyone, from uh, lunch break. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, at this point, we're going to go ahead and get started with the, the panel. Uh, the theme is change management in an evolving acquisition landscape. Uh, Joni Newhart, who spoke earlier, will be the moderator of the panel. And I'm going to turn it over to Joni, who will then introduce uh, the panel for us. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Welcome back, everybody. We have a stellar panel for you. We have, well, I'm, I'm going to not introduce them right now. I'm going to introduce them when I first ask them a question because I don't want time to be eaten up with introductions when we have a lot of good information for you. So um, do we have everybody here? Dan, you want to come on up? <laughs> he thought I'd forget about him. No such luck. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to all of you. So um, our panel is on the topic of change management in an evolving acquisition landscape. So we're going to talk a little bit about what these folks are individually doing with the overall topic. Hopefully you can get some ideas on how you can go back and implement this, because I know at your agencies it's challenging when you bring in new ideas sometimes. And these folks will help you navigate that a bit. So I'm going to start with my close colleague, Matthew Blum, who's the Associate Administrator at OFPP. Welcome, Matthew. Um, Matthew, you were the driving force for the TechFAR, which is a new approach to innovation and contracting, utilizing existing flexibilities. Can you tell us the purpose and path ahead for the TechFAR? Sure, Joni. Thanks very much. Um, I, when, I, when Mark ran the uh, demographics for today, I think that there were a very large percentage of folks that are in the procurement um, area. Hopefully, we have others from our IPT. But I know for all the procurement people in particular, you'll be well aware of the fact that for at least, I guess, 20 years now, there have been guiding principles uh, in the front of the federal acquisition regulation that say very expressly that if a particular strategy, policy, or procedure is in the best interest of the government, if it isn't addressed in the FAR and it isn't prohibited by law or regulation, um, that you are empowered, in fact, the acquisition team is empowered to innovate. Notwithstanding the fact that there is this very express language, and they do actually use the word innovate, <laughs> um, we don't actually train all that well to um, use that particular authority. And it actually, this is not a criticism of our good folks that, that help with training when you think about it. How do you train people to something that's not written, that may not be written down? How do we know what it is that we, that we want to train to? Well, the TechFAR um, was designed as a guide in part to try to identify areas of, of special interest and strategies that may be promising but aren't expressly addressed in the FAR to speak to and give examples of how you can use those strategies. Now, the first version of the tech FAR happened to focus on agile software development, um, but the, the purpose of the, of the document isn't to be focused on any one particular strategy, rather those strategies that, that aren't necessarily um, spelled out in, in the FAR. Two other um, purposes of the, of the tech FAR in addition to that is, one, to speak to the entire um, integrated uh, project or product team and not just to contracting officers. Um, it seems that a key component of innovation is the ability to have rapid information exchange. And by, the, by your own feedback to Mark in this conference about things that you see standing in the way of innovation is the fact that, try as we may, we still are siloed in many respects in our individual functions. So when we were working to put together this document, we wanted to write it in a way that it would speak to all the members of the IPT, not just the contracting officers, but the IT people, the program people, and the attorneys as well. We don't want it to be something that uh, everybody can't, can't look at and uh, understand. And lastly, we wanted to anticipate some of the questions that might occur between the IT acquisition uh, contracting officers and the attorneys. Um, for example, in agile software development, some of the refinement of the requirements will occur after a contract is awarded. And to a contracting officer that's going through classical training of what's full and open competition and perhaps supporting people in the traditional waterfall method, they will think, hmm, don't we have to have all the requirements identified up front before award in order to avoid running afoul of competition requirements? 
the tech FAR seeks to address that and ways in which refinements can be uh, uh, refined after uh, a contract award through customer input, through prototyping, uh, while still being fully compliant with all of our, our public uh, principles of competition um, and other uh, requirements of, of, of acquisition. So this is intended to be a living document, and uh, we're very interested in getting your feedback. If you haven't had a chance to take a look at it, you should go to the CIO webpage. Actually, if you just do a quick internet search, uh, it comes up, I think, in, in several different locations. Uh, and think about, have we asked the right questions? Um, does the format work? Um, and how, uh, maybe most importantly, can we make it a more dynamic tool? So that is, have you have specific questions that we haven't addressed, what are ways in which maybe we can uh, deal with that more rapidly? If that's something that's uh, important to you, we would love to get that type of feedback. And lastly, um, and I think this will be, my colleagues I think will probably, uh, hopefully reinforce this, um, the tech FAR is really just one tool. If you're going to unlock the flexibilities of the FAR, I think everybody that's here today knows that it's far beyond just whatever we do in the written word, either in the FAR or in policy. It's the sort of things that you were talking about earlier with DITAP and making sure that we have hands-on training so people that are not familiar with Agile can actually work with somebody that's had some experience with it. And it's also making sure we have access to information and documenting results, as Brian mentioned, um, with respect to buyers clubs so that people can emulate practices that have worked. And finally, and a challenge for from our managers, it's making sure that we encourage people when we, when we offer these tools and not mandate them so that we have those those that are willing that can be our leaders in some of these, these areas that may require entailment of some risk um, to take these challenges on and then share it with others that uh, prefer to wait and see. Great. Thank you, Matthew. So now we're going to move. You've met him earlier today, Brian Sivek. Thank you for coming. Chief Technology Officer and Entrepreneur in Residence at HHS. So Brian, I haven't known you for very long, but I love some of the stuff you're doing, and I think this crowd in particular would like to hear about that too, you spoke a little bit earlier about some things. Can you share more with us about the Idea Lab and how these guys might go back to their agencies and actually start one? <laughs> sure. um, so apologies for all you people over there that I can't see because of the podium. Um, I am here, I promise. Um, <clears throat> so actually, just a really quick question. How many people here are from HHS? Show of hands. Okay, good number, but not everybody by a long shot. That's great. So let me explain um, a little bit about what uh, the main sort of vehicle that we're putting a lot of this stuff through at HHS. It's something we call the Idea Lab. And uh, the Idea Lab itself, we started probably about a year, year and a half ago, maybe a little bit longer, although it's sort of been in the works in various ways, shapes, and forms for probably the last four or five years. Uh, really what it is, uh, is a, um, it's an entity that's designed to essentially try to create a more modern and effective government. And we do that by, uh, more than anything else, providing what we like to think of as a safe, uh, safe space for experimentation within the department. Uh, we believe that uh, it's only through sort of rapid and iterative and intelligent experimentation that we can actually move the ball forward on trying some of these new approaches that uh, we believe will deliver results. Um, really, the way that we like to think about the activities that we've got inside the Idea Lab is to focus it on answering, uh, or, or trying to solve, I should say, three problems that we've noticed across the board. Number one, uh, we've got, say, 90,000 or so employees at HHS who uh, for the most part, are um, incredible people working on incredibly important things, everything from refugee resettlement to finding the cure for cancer. Uh, and the problem is that we tend to not take advantage of uh, the skills that we have within the department to the extent that we can. A lot of these people have some fantastic ideas about new things that they can uh, try or uh, uh, ways that they can um, modify their efforts in order to generate better results, but the bureaucracy and the hierarchy and the red tape and the uh, you know, sort of command and control nature of all of these organizations prevents a lot of that from happening. So the first bucket of activities is really focused on trying to get more out of the people that work at HHS. Uh, we do this through a few different initiatives. One of them um, that uh, we've had some really interesting success with recently uh, something called uh, the HHS Ignite Accelerator. Uh, you can think of it like a, almost like a Silicon Valley accelerator. Teams apply, the ones that are selected 
uh, go through a three-month program where we basically give them a bunch of training on methodologies that they would never get in government. Uh, Human-centered design and design thinking, rapid implementation and experimentation, rapid prototyping, um, lean startup, things like that. And then uh, we give them $5,000, up to $5,000 per team. Turns out the money is the least important part. Uh, and then um, uh, essentially hold, uh, give them uh, advice and assistance along the way as they go down this path of trying to experiment with their ideas. Uh, we're in the third cohort of that right now, the third class, and some of the things that have been uh, developed have been pretty remarkable in terms of the, um, changing the way the missions of these agencies have been affected. So that's the first category. The second category uh, are a set of programs designed to answer the question, um, how do we get better skills uh, or people that have different skills into the government? Uh, to work on some pretty discrete and complex problems. So we've created a set of um, what we call in-residence programs that will bring people in for one to two year stints to actually work on some of these more complex issues. And then the third uh, category is really focused around this idea of breaking down the silos and creating these uh, c uh, collaborative communities. Um, really finding people from across the department in lots of different areas that uh, are all required to help deliver on a specific uh, idea or a specific mission. So the prototypical example of that is the Health Data Initiative. This is something that many of you have probably heard of. We started it about five years ago, and <clears throat> the, the goal of that is to essentially make all of this data that HHS has been creating or collecting or curating for years available to the public uh, to do interesting things with. And, uh, over the last five years, uh, we've had some pretty remarkable success. Uh, the things that people have done with this data uh, continue to amaze me. In fact, today, just today, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal that some of you guys might have seen uh, that used Medicare data to, um, that, in their analysis, indicated that certain hospitals were releasing patients in a three-day window where Medicare pays more for their stay, right? And so... Interesting things can happen when you start looking at data, and we've seen some fascinating stuff. Uh, the Buyers Club is sort of the newest example of one of these collaborative communities. As I said this morning, to me, the most important thing about this is getting people across the department in different disciplines to work together from day one on these implementations. Uh, and so it really fits in well with that overall mission. Um, I realize that we don't have a lot of time here, so I'll end there. There's lots of details. You can find out more on hhs.gov slash idealab. To answer your last question about how to do this in your own agency, um, I can't... I, <laughs> I don't really have time to answer that question fully. Um, what I will say is that one of the neat things that just happened is that in the FY16 budget that the president sent to Congress, there's actually funding, line items of funding in that budget for uh, six federal agencies uh, to implement their own version of the HHS Idea Lab. Uh, the agencies are SBA, Commerce, uh, Education, um, uh, Treasury, and I'm blanking on the fifth one, and HHS is the sixth. Uh, but uh, the neat thing is if Congress does pass that budget, those line items do make it in there, uh, we'll actually have some of these idea labs out there to continue to experiment with and to drive some of these changes further into the federal government. Great. Thank you, Brian. So we're going to move right now to Marina Martin, who's the Chief Technology Officer at the Department of Veterans Affairs. So Marina, I'm guessing you're a type A personality since you're the founder and CEO of Type A Way. <laughs> Just a guess. Good guess. <laughs> um, but so she's interesting because she has some government experience uh, at Department of Education and senior advisor to Todd Park, the former CTO of the US. And now she's CTO at VA. She has this um, background as an entrepreneur. So very, very interesting perspective. And I know that you're establishing a digital services team at VA. And knowing the VA a little bit, I'm thinking that's a little bit of a culture shock. And I'm just wondering, how on earth are you doing that? <laughs> uh, so culture shock, uh, you know, no culture it comes up in a vacuum. It all, the culture and the behaviors of your agency or a group are leftovers from previous experiences. So I think when you want to, there's change, there's a lot of fear around it, um, especially in government where we're constantly under a spotlight and people are constantly under scrutiny and there's performance plans and reviews and the, the respect of your peers. Um, so a big part of that is modeling the change that you want to see in the world. Uh, and in this particular space, it can mean uh, you know, actually doing your own agile contract and getting people crossing silos, bringing something that's successful and that's celebrated at your agency so that other people want to be a part of it, as opposed to what Matthew was saying, uh, feeling that they're 
being forced to do it. So we're hiring uh, this digital services team, which is bringing some top technologists from the private sector into VA for one to two year stints um, to help work on some of our key mission areas, you know, ending backlog, uh, modernizing our healthcare delivery platform, and improving the digital experience for our customers, our veterans. And uh, it's, it'd be easy and faster if we brought this team in and just said, okay, you guys do these few couple of projects off in a corner. Um, but the thing is, if we did that in two years, maybe the project would be done, but it would not have changed in 20 years. It'll still be done. It'll still be sitting in the corner, and it'll be, it'll be dusty. Uh, so it's about how do you find ways for people to work together. Um, there's a lot of fear, and I think perhaps even a little bit of resentment when you bring in new people or new ideas. It's, hey, you know, what we had before was working. Um, and you got to bring p folks in and find opportunities, however big or small, for them to work together to view it as a learning experience, as a cooperative experience, and not as a forced a forced experience. Um, one example that I've been working on lately is a, a new way that we do disability evaluations. Um, our examiners today have a very old software that, for example, does not let them use their mouse. Um, so it's, it's a kind of a frustrating experience. And one way to try to change that would be to write a really long requirements document covering all the different things we wanted to do, but we wanted to do this differently. So actually, we spent a month in the field being examined, sitting in on exams, trying out prototypes. Um, and the new one, you know, which is now in, in pilot launch, is really well received by all the different stakeholders. And this was a very complica complex cross-silo endeavor. Um, and I hope, and, you know, I was telling Matthew earlier, one of the, or Brian, I think, uh, the highlight of my career at VA thus far was this one moment when someone got mad at someone else and said, why can't I update this app like I can update Marina's app? And I was like, oh, you know, <laughs> we've sparked something, somebody wants to do something differently uh, and in a good way. So I think it's about modeling the behavior that you want to see. It's about knowing and acknowledging that people are scared and that there's a lot of risks that uh, that they feel in ways that you may not, depending on where you are and how, how new to government you are. As if you can find ways to give them credit and absorb the risk yourself, I think that's a really good strategy. Uh, and that still ultimately gets you, gets you to your goal. And again, start out small. Like You might not want to start out with a, a big, giant project as your first agile cross-silo initiative. You may want to start with a small tool. One great example we have at VA is the GI Bill comparison tool. It's a one-page open source JavaScript tool, but in the background it takes eight disparate data sets um, and pulls them together into one super easy tool so a veteran can understand uh, how to get the most bang for their buck for their GI Bill benefits, which pays for them to go to school. If you pick the wrong GI Bill chapter, you can miss out on a lot of uh, dollars that you would otherwise be entitled to. So it's an important decision that was previously really complicated. And with a quick prototype and lots of user feedback, um, we were able to get a tool out there that's really helping veterans. So, so Great, thank you. And I see a theme here talking to the users right up front. Everybody's talking about that. That's fantastic. So now I'm going to turn to Dan Doney, who I love your title, Dan, Chief Innovation Officer at, get this, Defense Intelligence Agency. Those two don't seem to match. But tell us a little bit about what you're doing. I've read that you're an instigator and a pot stirrer, so I like you already, even though I don't know you. Um, but I'm intrigued with some of the things that you're doing. So what is it like in the life of a chief innovation officer? Thanks a lot, Joni. So uh, the innovation challenge is my, my title, my job is very new at the Defense Intelligence Agency. I've only been in the position for two years now. Um, there's considerable misunderstanding regarding the challenge associated with innovation. They thought that innovation um, broadly is uh, the workforce generally held, that it was someone else's responsibility, either our science and technology group, our innovation group, or uh, um, an office, somebody else's job, or maybe our new chief innovation officer. Um, he would be the guy who would handle this. Um, in fact, that's a clear sign of a particular problem. As soon as I walked through the door, um, I, my door was pounded through with people who had good ideas in our workforce. Um, and it wasn't just that we needed more parking. There were lots of other good, fundamental, mission-changing ideas in our workforce. We really needed to be able to tap into those ideas. So within government, the challenge for innovation was, again, not a lack of ideas, but an inability to efficiently convert ideas into action and specifically emerging ideas, the kinds of things that you didn't plan for, but rather that came up as a matter of opportunity. So I'm going to be speaking a little bit later, um, specifically about three principles that are guaranteed to make your government 
agency innovative. I promise you, I guarantee it, I'll stand behind it. If you enact these three principles, you will get there. And then four initiatives to actually prove um, that those principles are in fact valid. So I'm gonna get into that, but I'm gonna hit on, on one of them here um, in this particular panel in a little bit more detail. So we looked at, um, again, the thinking was that we needed to go after some great big shine, bright shiny object or that innovation had a lot to do with IT. None of these things are true. It really comes down to fundamental organizational agility. So can you quickly marshal resources, matching the individuals with needs to the best possible solution wherever they emerge? Innovation is that simple. What's so hard about that? Well, when you look at all the processes that we engage in, you see we do almost everything to block um, those sets of conditions. We don't give ourselves in execution year fiscal agility um, as, as one thing. So how do we plan for the unplanned is an important piece of this. The people who actually represent our needs are not the individuals closest to what we call the mission edge, the ones who actually enact what our mission does. Instead, we rely on professional program managers, acquisition professionals, senior leaders, in order to represent our particular needs instead of those folks. And we don't have effective mechanisms to reach outside of traditional circles to get to the best possible ideas wherever they sit, okay? So it turns out, um, I found out, much to my chagrin, I'm an MIT-trained nuclear engineer, that our problem had a lot more to do with our back office than you know, clever new ideas um, that need to be injected into our system. So it turns out that most of our reform centers around acquisition um, reform elements. It's the responsibility of the acquisition professional to make this match between marshalling resources against matching need to solution provider. So it was there that we really needed to inject new energy. Specifically, um, we saw two problems we had to attack. The first problem was we only get what we know to ask for in our acquisition circles. And the problem is there are many ideas out there that are disruptive and emerging, and we just don't know to ask for them. So we had to create a model that allowed us to efficiently deal with that. And the second is, it's hard to ask. So it was taking us six to nine months to put out an RFI, RFP, broad agency announcement, and, and so on. We needed to, to allow our non-traditional consumers that is the folks closest to the mission edge, to engage in this process, we made it, had to make it easy for them to ask within a day um, for a specific, whatever it is that they're looking for. So we set up something almost quite by accident called Needopedia. Needopedia is actually a fairly simple model. There's a lot of complexity behind the scenes, but it starts like this. Many of you are familiar with open broad agency announcements. Lots of research organizations use this. Sort of a, a broad statement of what kinds of things you're looking for in a great big um, document full of human subjects, testing rules, and other things. So we took that piece, and instead of where you would normally put your thrust areas, the areas of interest to you, we have a link to a dynamic document called Needopedia. So now we have all of our acquisition rigor built into this um, framework, which is largely static. But um, the place where we're actually asking for a thing is a very dynamic document. So now when a mission element, somebody at the edge, someone who has never engaged in the acquisition process has a need, they can state it very simply, and we can publish it um, sometimes within a day, but generally in less than a week out to industry saying, hey, we're looking for solutions to this particular problem. And we have a fully FAR compliant model behind the scenes to go ahead and um, address that particular challenge. This allowed us to ask much smaller and what's very important to coordinate when we asked. It became very apparent who was looking for what, not just within our agency, but outside of uh, our agency. <coughs> now this model is not just applicable to our agency. In fact, we've rewritten the BAA so that it's open to all of government. There's, it sounds simple, but there are many tricks behind the scene to effectively executing this. This is one of the principal initiatives, on, and I promise several more a little bit later. Oh, you're such a tease. <laughs> I can't wait. I'll stick around for that. So now we're going to move to Mark Jones. I believe Mark is where the rubber hits the road, right? He's a contracting officer at the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, who we all know and love as DARPA. And Mark, I saw online that you have experience with BAA, so it's very timely, and that you recently had a proposer's day. So I've been in contracting for a while. I never heard it called that, so that piqued my interest as well. But tell us uh, about some of the innovative acquisition strategies you're trying and the results that you're getting. Sure, absolutely. Um, 
just to put DARPA into context, of course, we're a uh, uh, s and a research agency for the Department of Defense, and we do a lot of their fundamental research for them and, and rely uh, heavily on the use of the BAAs as, as our tools. So as you guys know, BAA, you're putting your problem out there and you're asking for any and all solutions to that problem. So uh, the use of the term industry day for us always seemed wrong because we're not just looking for the, the typical defense industry responses. We're really looking for a lot of academic responses. We're looking for a lot of responses from uh, nonprofit research agencies and a lot of these startups, people who are, who are in the commercial world who maybe are not typical uh, government contractors. So we use a lot of tools and techniques along with the BAA, such as uh, we have the uh, other transaction authority to use, uh, and we rely on a lot of other things, uh, fixed price uh, with uh, incentive or uh, milestone payments, things of that nature to try to get a lot of people and encourage people to participate in our, our BAAs. Um, another approach that we've uh, recently uh, utilized, uh, it's called the uh, EZBAA, where uh, we found that there's a lot of barriers. People have a lot of fear, a lot of, they don't want to spend a lot of money to propose against some of our BAAs. They, there's this feeling that they're always going up against uh, the big defense contractors and they're just going to lose. So uh, what we've tried to do is limit the size and the scope of the, of the BAA make it small enough that it's really more of uh, about a $700,000 effort or less so that folks can um, feel that they don't have to spend as much money to submit a proposal. They're submitting to like an office-wide BAA. They're uh, submitting uh, unique ideas that we might be interested in looking at. And along with that, of course, we include a lot of examples of what's a fixed price milestone payment? What's a OT gonna look like? What's a cost type contract gonna to look like? So these folks who are just not familiar with government contracting have something at their fingertips to look at and, and digest and feel more comfortable and try to get over that fear of dealing with, with uh, DARPA and dealing with the government. And then some other things that we've done, uh, again, this was in the uh, cyber realm. We had issues trying to get some of the, the better cyber uh, researchers out there who didn't want to participate with the, the government, they had a number of either perceived or actual barriers that they would not uh, allow us to, to use or they couldn't overcome those barriers based on the rules that we uh, are all governed by under the FAR and DFARS, well, for me, the DFARS. Um, so we had to come up with a new technique, which we called the Cyber Fast Track, and this was a, a tool that we put in place. It relied on a, a like a prime vendor. and. Uh, had him act as our prime, he was under a contractual uh, agreement with us that he would then put these subs on within a, a very short time frame using commercial practices. He had to put them on within 10 days. Another technique we used, we called it uh, a program announcement versus a BAA, and, and, and that we put out, hey, this is what we're interested in, and you're gonna subcontract to this prime vendor, but we want you to submit your ideas to us and let us take a look at your ideas first. What we did is what we called pre-consent. We would look at these ideas and, and decide whether or not they made sense before they went to the prime, in which case it sort of cut out some of the steps and some of the middlemen to facilitate this process so that we could get people on, on contract faster because in the cyber world, everything is fast and everything has to be reactive quickly. So this was our technique. This was an experiment, we called it. Um, we uh, took this had it going for about a year before we took it over to uh, the Air Force and asked them to take a look, see if they thought it made sense as well. They adopted it as well uh, and took it over from us and uh, uh, it, uh, embraced the, the program as well. So the philosophy that allows some of this at DARPA is, of course, we're risk-taking agency, but we're also uh, willing to look at this from the perspective of if, if it doesn't say you can't do it within the FAR and you go to, and I'm gonna get the reference wrong, but it's somewhere in the FAR 1 or FAR 2, where it talks about as a contracting officer, it's really your responsibility to do what makes the good business sense. What well, Use your good business sense to make uh, uh, decisions. As long as you can make a good business case and it's not against the rules, then DARPA's willing to experiment with it and try that uh, and, and use those uh, techniques to try to do whatever we can to get the best ideas to try to solve some of these solutions facing the government. Great, thank you, Mark. And you just made Matthew's day by referring to the FAR like that. <laughs> so last but certainly not least is Lisa Schlosser. I first met Lisa a few years ago when she was at a conference speaking. Uh, she worked at HUD at the time and all about collaboration. So she was on a panel with her 
CAO, um, her CFO, she was the CIO there. And so I think her middle name is probably Collaboration. But that's not what I'm going to ask her about. But if you we have a little Q&A after this, if you want to hear more about that, please feel free to ask. I was hoping Lisa could tell us a little bit about Fatara and how it might be a game changer at the agencies. It came up earlier today, and she's the one who knows. All right, great. Uh, thanks, Joni. And um, wow, this is such a great panel with so many great ideas. And I've worked with, I know, Marina and Brian and, and Matthew and Joni. And um, I, I really hope you take uh, what they said to heart and some of the initiatives and, and the other panelists. I just haven't worked directly with you, but uh, it's really some great ideas. So I want to do just a little bit of uh, group participation here first. So how many people uh, actually use Amazon or Zappos or Google on a daily basis? Just raise your hand. Everybody should be raising their hand, right? Okay. How many people uh, have a smartphone? Okay. How many people don't have a smartphone? Don't raise your hand. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so let's talk afterwards, though. Um, so um, how many people here are uh, somehow involved with buying, building, or delivering government IT solutions? Okay, super. Um, so um, so I, I asked you those questions because I, I want to lead into something that, that my colleagues have talked about, and it is change and change management. And what's, I think, one of the, the key points when you are in an era where we are right now, uh, where we are um, really on the brink of some amazing transformational change in the way uh, that we use technology in the federal government and our expectations of technology. And through that, you know, to make that change happen, I think everybody involved in, in that organization or that process or that change uh, has to start with a common ground. And I think we all, by raising our hands, have a common ground that we want to start with. So how, how many people here who are involved with buying, building, or delivering technology want that technology that they're buying, building, or delivering to be as good and reliable as Google, as Amazon, as Zappos? Did anybody not raise their hand with that? So, um, so, um, so common sense that we all want to start with that. So how do we get there from here um, and manage this change? How do we all manage this change to, to do this better? Um, so, so number one, at a very macro level, uh, there's something called the Federal Information Technology um, Acquisition Reform Act, or FATARA. How many people have heard of FATARA? Okay, if you haven't heard of FATARA, you're definitely going to hear about FATARA because it impacts everybody in this room. It impacts acquisition professionals, IT professionals. Uh, and while some may look at this and say, oh my goodness, it's just putting more burden and reporting and requirements and giving my CIO all the power and the money and the authority, not true, okay, first of all. Um, what FATARA really is, is something that gives all of us this amazing opportunity to transform federal government IT. So what FATARA basically, there's several parts to FATARA. It does talk about CIO authorities, okay, and it gives CIOs greater authority and basically actually says in the law that CIOs need to approve uh, basically all IT acquisitions and contracts, uh, IT budgets across the organization, and, uh, but um, tied with that, they're responsible for making sure that IT solutions are delivered effectively and efficiently. So, um, so that's, that's one thing uh, that comes out in FATARA. Um, but, but secondly, uh, FATARA also talks about driving efficiencies through, um, through portfolio stat, tech stat, and other programs that hopefully you're all familiar with that help us really look at IT, how we're acquiring IT, how we're delivering, how we're developing IT, and do it better. Um, and the third part of FATARA, uh, equally as important as the first two, uh, talks about acquisition and acquisition reform um, and talks about how um, we can do a better job um, across the board training our IT acquisition professionals, doing the things that some of the panelists talked about, uh, really kind of um, making sure that we understand requirements uh, better uh, from the beginning. Um, it also talks about strategic sourcing. Um, it codifies some of our strategic sourcing initiatives in law. Um, and it also requires us to do a better job with enterprise software licensing. 
okay? Um, so all those things are in the law. Um, so what are we doing uh, about kind of figuring out how we implement this law across the federal government? So, so OMB, um, both the e-government team as, as well as our OFPP team, our whole team actually on the M side and the B side, uh, are going out and talking to people like you. And hopefully some of you have been involved with some of these sessions to give us feedback on what we need to do with Batara to implement it right, to make sure that the acquisition community is involved with implementing things like you know, how does the CIO approve all contracts, right? I mean, that's a big deal. So how do we do that effectively and not so it's just the CIOs? CIOs have to do this with the acquisition community and we all have to do it in conjunction with the budget community. So we are in the process of getting feedback from everybody in this room and across the communities to figure out how we do that best to get to that ultimate goal that we all have to better buy, deliver, uh, you know, buy, build, and deliver technology as a strategic enabler for all our missions, for all our support functions. So, um, so that's what we're doing with Fatara. And so I'll go kind of one level uh, more and, and talk about the tools that, that collectively, you've heard some of the tools that our, my fellow panelists have been putting out there, some of the innovations, the idea labs, some of the work Marine is doing with digital services, um, the buyers club, uh, all these, the, the tech far. Um, we have also, um, for those of you that maybe are, are new to the, the acquisition community, about two years ago, we actually put out a guide on modular contracting and how you put in place contracts to allow for agile delivery delivery and development of new technology, which is state-of-the-art practice now. Um, so those tools are out there. A another thing that, that I'll announce this group that just went out today uh, is that um, the, CIO, the CIO Council is sponsoring what we're calling um, a uh, solutions challenge group. And we are soliciting names uh, of individuals um, in the nine through 12 range uh, to, to be on a team, and we're gonna be very selective about this team, but this team's gonna come in uh, and work together and identify challenges across IT, across IT acquisition, and then spend time together coming up with solutions uh, to overcome those challenges as a team. And those teams are gonna present those solutions to the senior leadership at OMB and the CIO councils and the chief acquisition officers councils and others. So, um, so this is a really neat opportunity for everybody to get involved with, with the next generation of how we buy and build and deliver technology. So I just kinda wanted to end my talk with, with that and a uh, plea to all of you, if you wanna know more about that, I'll be here for a couple minutes after uh, the session session here, um, but we're also sending out um, the, note, the notes and, the, and soliciting candidates for this program um, you know, through the CIO Council and through the Chief Acquisition Officers uh, Council, so it'll be out in each year agency. So if you want to be part of this and, and part of some of the great things here and uh, to bring your ideas that might not surface up, as somebody on the team said, that not, I think Brian said, that, that not all the great ideas we have, if, if we're not at the, the executives in the organization or senior leaders or managers, get to the kind of bubble up to the top, but we want those great ideas from all parts of the organization to bubble up. So uh, please look at that opportunity um, and, uh, and apply for it, and also use some of the tools that you've heard here today uh, from my other panelists and some of the tools that, that I mentioned as well. So thanks, Joni. Sure, so we have a stellar panel. I don't know when you'll have the chance to ask them questions together again. So think about your question and come up to the mics. And in the meantime, if you're looking for an ally to help you with some of the stuff you're hearing today, maybe go meet your CIO, because it sounds like they're gonna be responsible for some of this, and they'd be a good ally. Also, there's another conference called Acquisition Excellence on March 3rd, put on by ACT IAC, that continues a lot of the same conversation. It's downtown somewhere, just Google it. Um, and check your Google skills and you'll be able to find it, uh, but take a look at that. So, okay, I see you all lining up at the microphones, <laughs> not. All right, so while you're still thinking about that question, I'm gonna toss one out for these guys. Um, oh, you're gonna ask a question, please, I defer to you. Hello, my name is Anthony Delke and I'm a contract officer at Overseas Private Investment Corporation. I've been there for a little less than a year now and prior to that, I was a contractor and I served with about four different government agencies, so I think I know how government culture works. Um, and one of the things I've seen uh, since this issue about change management is that procurement is usually the last department to find out about procurements. So um, I, I know a lot of times in the um, different programs, people come up with all these great ideas and they, and they spend months and months thinking about it and they think they have it all teed up 
and then they give it to procurement, and it's the first time procurement's seen it. And they're like, okay, this $20 million package, you know, let me now start reviewing it. And people start getting frustrated with procurement taking much longer. And then procurement also gets frustrated with being the last to see this, you know, X million dollar uh, procurement. It's very circular motion. So um, can you guys speak to that and any changes you wanna um, do to change that culture? I mean, I'll just say one thing really quickly, which is that <clears throat> what you just described is sort of the whole point to me of the Buyers Club, yeah. right? Um, procurement, legal, program, uh, everybody who's got a stake in the matter should be involved from day one. Because if not, then you're gonna get a solicitation that is gonna be less than optimal. Uh, and so part of the idea behind this whole thing is to invest some of these new uh, techniques and actually old techniques in many cases in the folks that are sitting in this room so that you can go back and say, look, you know, let, we should be involved from the beginning because if we are, we can help you craft something that's actually gonna be faster, better, and cheaper. So that, to me, that's the whole point of this thing. And, and I'll say specifically, Anthony, Anthony, right? Correct. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for your comment because this is like, the, the acquisition and the CIO people need, and I'd say not even day one, I'd say day zero. Like, we, like at the beginning of the year, I think we should have strategic sourcing plans you know or an acquisition plans where it's the, the the acquisition team and the and the inf uh, the cio team and the budget team really sitting together and deciding these are the procurements we're going to do and from there forming ipts you know that that come up with the actual acquisition strategy you know which of these tools do we use to go forward what are the requirements how do we do that and i i actually think that as you see the the guidance that that's going to be coming out on the implementation of fatara that exact issue is going to to be addressed. So I appreciate hearing that it is at the the front of the uh, the acquisition officer's minds. So thanks. Thank you. So while I have these folks here, um, just a quick question. At different times in my career, I've I've had these what I thought were really good ideas, and I'd I'd approach my boss with them or other people, and they're just very risk averse and they're like, you know, thanks, that's a great idea, but let's do this old thing we've always been doing. So how on earth, how on earth can you break through something like that at the agency? Do y'all have some advice? I'm pretty sure you've faced that before too. <laughs> uh, my first government job was as an entrepreneur in residence at the Department of Education and my boss there, Richard at the time, uh, told me something that I will never forget, which was, if you don't do this, nobody will. And it was about like a dumb piece of paperwork, but it was enough paperwork that nobody else was gonna go through the six months of it. I think about that a lot in my job at VA. My, uh, my cell phone cover is actually a Tolkien quote, uh, deep roots are not touched by the frost. Because it's like, can I get that work done um, in enough that it's not gonna just disappear you know, next month? Um, so I would say, take, take that charge. Like find some way that you can show that there's benefit, that there's ROI, that you'll take the risk on yourself or on your own shoulders. Whatever you can do to find some way to take that next step forward so that it becomes less of a risk and less of a new thing and more of a, gosh, why don't we do that? That's great. Lisa? And, and a, another theme that I think most folks on the panel mentioned was, um, you know, this this idea of agile. So some of some of the best big ideas in the world started with a little idea and a little implementation that was successful, that we promoted, that we communicated. And then I, I've watched kind of Marina since her time here, and I've seen that that's exactly the way she's she's done things: run a little pilot, um, you know, uh, get some success out of that pilot, and then scale that pilot. So so I think. Thinking agile uh, and and doing incremental, um, you know, um, um, pilots and, and getting the word out is is really key to uh, kind of driving bigger change in the long run. I think the magic word is pilot. We can sell anything on a pilot basis, right? Anything. So, Mark, I'm sure when you came into contracting that you weren't, uh, you know, you were learned the rules, you followed the rules. So, how did you get to be this like innovative? Was it um, some leadership at your agency or a boss that you had that was good or just something inherent within you? Well, at, at DARPA, uh, it's a very lean organization. Um, and so my access to the leadership is I walk next door. There's, it's, very, it's, a, it's a very lean organization. It's a very fast and dedicated organization that is, uh, has, a, has a very unique mission that you can quickly identify with. So. It helps a lot when you have that identity to go for, especially in an R&T environment. 
Uh, it also helps that when you can go to parts of the FAR, like part 35 for, for research and development that says you're not to make this too burdensome. You're not supposed to uh, make this process too hard. It's about getting the research out the door and, and getting people to start the process. We understand at DARPA solutions probably won't be for 10 more years. I probably won't see it sometimes in my career, the actual end product. But we need to uh, implement these things quickly. So that culture already exists at DARPA. And uh, it had to sort of get that culture in other organizations. Uh, you know, that that's a tough question. Um, I think a lot of it is, again, you've got to um, rely on going through the FAR and your other regulations, seeing what can be done or seeing what can't be done, and as long as it doesn't fall within what can't be done, and you can make it, like I said, a good business case, you get your market research together, you get help from other people who can also uh, help champion that cause, and, and, and like you said, like a pilot program where you, you coach it as, hey, let's experiment this, you scope it down to a, a reasonable uh, amount, uh, then that should be what you need to get the project forward, to get it out there, try it. If it doesn't work, then you, know, you go back and, and try again, do something else. Great, I think we have another question. Uh, good afternoon, thank you for your time. Uh, my name is James Filposian, I'm a contractor supporting an acquisitions office in the government. I guess um, one of the sayings that I kind of keep repeating is, today's pilot, tomorrow's sole source. And so with the interest of competition then, I guess the question is, how is it that you ensure that these pilots do not become basically a repetitive sole source every five years or so? Like what is the transition from, okay, you have this pilot and you can cut it off if it doesn't work. What do you do when they really like it and you have conflict of interest rules, you have competition rules, you have small business rules, all these different regulations surrounding it. So what is the strategy then to kind of enabling pilots without running afoul of competition and conflict of interest? Good question. I'm gonna look at you, uh, Matthew. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll tackle it first because when I talk about a pilot, I, I don't necessarily mean going to one particular vendor or one particular company or one particular you know technology to run a pilot. Like. I think the way we move forward, the best way and get the best solution is is do bake-offs for pilots. You know, like how the the current and and maybe Matthew or, or Joni can weigh in, but I know that or, or anybody else that that GSA is running one of these now, where they're putting out simple requirements, going through a a bake-off with and letting you know kind of the community come in with different solutions and and then seeing which of those pilots actually work best for uh, for that particular uh, problem, or maybe it's more than one for that solve a different part of the problem so uh, to me competition is how we how we keep refreshed and competition for pilots as well so um, that's how I see it manifesting I don't know if, no, uh, I, I think that's else. right when, we, when we're using the term pilot I think it's it's not just in the context of solving <laughs> one particular problem but in finding ways where we can uh, test new ways of doing business I think that's the, kind of a common theme that I that I've heard from my colleagues here so it's not specific to a particular vendor um, and I really have to echo I did the, the great word somebody, I think it was you, Dan, that said that we don't efficiently convert ideas into action. Um, and I think pilots are, are, the, are the best way to be able to do that. Um, because people, when they generally get concerned, and I don't necessarily know there's people in this room, but um, those that ultimately are responsible and accountable um, uh, at, at a larger level, for example, if we're thinking about legislation and talking to Congress, People have lots of really good and different ideas, and people can get nervous if they think that an authority is going to be used to affect you know, billions of dollars without it being proven. Whereas if you have a pilot and you're talking about a few million dollars, um, and sometimes when we're talking about I, some, some types of IT delivery, it can be even less than that, um, hopefully the anxiety level can go way down. And yet the power, if you can show that something works, if it's documented and we can scale it up, that's how you really make change. The, the definition of a pilot is something that you can easily let go, whether successful or not. Um, and so we, we scope in our, we have an innovation development process which is really designed to turn idea into action, that is idea to initiative, that involves making a business case very quickly, and then quickly acting on it to buy down risk. One of our first, in fact, the very first pilot that we engaged in to prove out this model was um, enacting wireless 
in a top secret network. Now, um, all y'all use wireless, you probably use it at home, that seems like no big deal. We've done it actually in an operational setting in the intelligence community. Um, that's a really big deal. Um, obviously, if you can break that, you can get to a lot of stuff. So we had to do that piece um, very effectively. It is game changing from an operational perspective if you can do it. As soon as we got the pilot approved, the planners came in and said, well, wait a minute here. We can't start this pilot because what happens if, when this pilot is successful, everyone's gonna want it. They're gonna want it across our organization. So we can't do this until we understand what the costs are um, for a broad release across the, the agency. My question was, well, who of you has actually implemented a wireless solution? Have you done it um, in your operational setting? Because if you haven't, because what they wanted to do was commission a six month study to study what the cost would be over the long haul. <laughs> would you really understand and discern that the results of that study in order to be able to enact it if you haven't tried it? Now the one thing that we couldn't compromise on in our setting is security. So we focused like a laser on this, that issue. Sustainability, we are willing to waive. Cost, we are willing to waive. Let's try it and understand it. And what was key, if when we're done, can we let it go? successful or failure, and we did. Um, we successfully proved it out, and we came to understand the total cost to the rest of the enterprise as a result of the pilot, not before the pilot. And from that now, we're able to, we're moving out much more aggressively. We, people had spent an inordinate amount of dollars trying to attack this problem. The way to do it was through a quick, targeted six-month initiative, do it and understand the enterprise implications. Thank you very much. Well, I want to thank the panel. You've been absolutely amazing, and thank you for taking your time to come share your ideas with us. Let's give them a round of applause.